Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. I'm very pleased to be joined by Margaret Mushla. Margaret's the Vice President for Project Development at CWP Global. Most people know CWP Global in the green hydrogen space. They're one of the early pioneers driving out a huge pipeline uh, of projects, and they've been pretty much sort of first to market in, in, in most of the major major um, markets looking to develop huge gigawatt scale projects. So welcome, Margaret. Thank you very much. So you're Good you're to gonna be here. yeah, you're gonna be speaking at the, the World Hydrogen Congress um again, which is fast approaching us in October, October the 9th, 13th. Very excited um to have you there to speak. Um obviously as I mentioned, CWP's projects are are staggering in scale when, when you look at the numbers, and we were just talking before um, and just catching up with, with some of those numbers. So 170 gigawatt pipeline of projects um, with you know, huge projects um, being planned or in the, in the process of, of development um, must be a, a, a huge, uh, amazing um, time to be involved in the energy industry. Um, I guess your own personal background, you're, you're Namibian, you're, you're a vice president at NAM Power for a number of years. You've seen the energy transition and have been involved in, um, you know, uh, working in, in government utility, I guess, on the electron side mainly. What, what, what are your, some of your thoughts around, um, you know, hydrogen and, and, and the scale of the projects that you're doing and, and, and some of the, the work just to sort of give us some of your sort of big picture insights initially? Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, working on a multitude of projects in different countries and in and, and this scale is obviously a, a massive privilege. Uh, it gives us insight um, on, on, a, on a different type of development, uh, which, which stretch way beyond the normal IPP power to electron development. Um, although the uh, green hydrogen projects or, or and its derivatives have components of, of power power to electricity projects or it, a resource to electricity projects in it, it is it is a long value chain and and that value chain that that long value chain and the scale of it obviously brings different complexities. Mm -hmm. Having said this, what we found across our projects in the different countries, we found a lot of commonalities um, between between the projects and whether it's, it's a project which are to be approved by the host government uh, in a partnership with the host government or private sector owner uh, developers or private sector um, land owners, um, we 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 see exactly the same questions, the same uh, requirements um, coming through from all projects, which allow us then to implement efficiently our projects. Um, um, it allow us to, to, to take learnings from one project to the other project mm -hmm. um, and also, also inform. Uh, we, we're coming into countries where we realize that uh, um, the specific country might be a little bit behind some other of, of the other countries that we're working and it's and it's great to inform and guide in some extent. So we're very humble that we have can play this specific position in, okay. in there. Uh, in my background from from uh, infrastructure projects, fun, um, uh, developing um, infrastructure projects from crypt to cradle, um, obviously what brings what brings to the table is the complexity in the different disciplines. So, so I'm a puzzle builder, and I like building that puzzle, and and I like building that puzzle even if there's no manual. Um, so, and this is what we do in green hydrogen. We we were talking about uh, Duplo blocks. Uh, yeah. You know, this is what we do. We're putting together a a nice Duplo block. Uh, uh, a, a city without having a manual and figuring it out as we go along. Yeah, the ba the baby form of Lego, I think, uh, as we we said before, because the yes. scale the scale of what you're doing is 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 just you know ridiculous numbers, particularly when when you come out of working mainly in the in the renewable energy sector, which which I've been working in. But um, yeah, I mean the the. The, I mean, I don't even know how you start to get these projects off the ground. The, 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 I mean, there must be a number of constraints. The, I guess first is, yeah, getting the, the, the host governments to, to understand that the scale of the opportunity. And I guess firstly, the, the, where you're going and location, it's location, location, location. So some of the countries I think you mentioned before were Djibouti and Mauritania and, and obviously Australia, I guess, is your, 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 your most well-developed project to date. So we're looking at... Um, coastal deserts that have good wind, good solar, uh, and are also easy to export because the, the product you're producing is, is for mainly for export markets. Is that right? Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, with due cognizance of the ability of the country to absorb the project, 
Um, so the, the easy part getting into is uh, getting into a project and, and, and convincing people. Uh, it's such a good story to tell and, and, and that makes it makes our life easy. So it's easy to get into a country with its private owners or, or government land owners to convince them and, and help them to see the, the abilities, uh, the opportunities. Um, uh, for, from there onwards, the hard work start. It is um, there, there are a number of issues and, and challenges that need to be addressed. The one coming into a host government is obviously what 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 is it that the host government would like to do? You know what what would be form what would be the basis of a good partnership with the host government or the landowner? And we we really need to form partnerships because getting into a country um, with a capital intensive project that needs a very long-term relationship and can have a long-term relationship because we're talking about an inexhaustible resource, you really need to form partnerships. You don't know the answers from, from the beginning. Um, so what is the basis of that? What will form that partnership? What is the basis of that partnership? This is one of the first things that we need to establish. And whether that partnership needs to be in a new regulatory, defined in a new reg reg regulatory legislative environment is the mm -hmm. next stage. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, what would, and how does it fit into existing uh, environment to make it, um, to make it sustainable? Um, and, and, and acceptable. Um, environmentally, obviously, we're working in areas which are by, by its nature sensitive. So it's very important for us to understand the environmental process. So one of the first things that we do when we get into a country is to do environmental screening. Mm -hmm. And even be, before we, we select the, 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 the parcels of land or areas that we could think we could develop, we do an environmental screening and try to screen out no-go and sensitive areas mm -hmm. to the, uh, as much as possible. Um, and and then and then you start developing the project. The 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 uh, and this is what we've been doing the last two to three years. This is getting in it. We're getting to a stage now where we need to say, okay, we are the off takers. So yeah. the, so the, the the next challenge that we have with this project is find sufficient off take uh, arrangements that convince lenders or, or, or investors that the projects will actually provide a good return, uh, yeah. will be bankable, will be financeable. So currently, a, a, a lot of our efforts, and our, our, we, we, you know, we go through different stages of development, but currently a lot of our efforts is to engage with off-takers and mm -hmm. potential off-takers. And again, the, there's there's no there's no offtake arrangement that says green hydrogen or green ammonia. It is all pioneering work. So okay. so it's in building a partnership that say how are we going to do this for a long term offtake um, in a developing market. We look we're obviously looking towards um, a typical markets like the LNG market. See what we can learn from there, yeah. um, and 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 find solutions there, and then. Um, Parallel to that is the financing strategy. Um, these projects are capital intensive. They are not. They 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 not really mixed. They are not ready made. Um, yeah. There's a lot of angles that that needs to be redefined. Whether it is upscaling, um, with upscaling in insurance requirements, upscaling in financing requirements, upscaling in government risk requirements. Um, so it just brings it on a total different level. So we are talking to a number of institutions, um, you know, and different asset classes to try and understand what would be the best way of financing the first projects or the first scale of the projects, and what will be what will refinancing mean in the in the end. So this is this is where where we currently yeah. are working. Yeah. And so we on the one side we help governments getting the the host government ready. Um, talking about off-takers and financing. And then the last thing, which is most critical to us, is these projects won't get built with unless they get built by the host, the host country itself. Um, mm -hmm. the, the type of, of construction required here, you can only do it by employing people in country. Yeah. They in on the land, in the face. Um, so getting the the host government um, um, citizens ready to be able to be contracted, to be employed, um, and to participate is the other challenge that yeah. we deal with. And, which is, and which is obviously a, a you know, bigger opportunity, I guess, for the for the host country. Um, Absolutely, but but it's also it's also massive. I mean, we we talk about thousands, you know, of of direct employment, mm. indirect and induced, um, three or four times. Our, our multiplication factors on these projects is between two and two point three and three. 
um, when you when you when you go to indirect and induce labor and 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 people need to get ready and they need to be informed um, yeah. and they they need to be given the tools we, we're working a lot with small medium enterprise development for instance and it's mm-hmm. not only getting them developed but also getting the financing in order to participate um, uh, uh, meaningful into these projects um, for you to actually benefit as a as a project uh, sponsor yeah. um, and lower the risk so, so yeah these are the angles we we work on when we develop these projects and i guess the, i mean the, the, there's always a, a phased approach so it's not like you just build it and suddenly all the drops all the jobs disappear there, there's always continual construction work as you you phase through and, and scale up the project which takes Absolutely. you know not i mean it must take i mean i don't you know in terms of the actual development of a you know seven gigawatt project it must take years um, yeah so of, this is yeah. exactly what these mega scale projects bring they bring their mm. own project pipeline yeah so 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 we normally have you employ people in the construction period and then you have this high peak construction employment and after that you mm. know um they it's operational it goes down we're going to be perpetually in construction. Um, yeah. So we're going to start, and and so so the teams are going to move forward. Not only this, you're going to you you going to have a great opportunity for learning taking place. So mm-hmm. today's team will become tomorrow's supervisors, for instance, yeah. or team yeah. members. So it gives you great gives you a great opportunity to do that, and then and then once you have constructed, if it's thirty gigawatts, it might take you ten years to do mm-hmm. that. Yeah, you will start with refurbishing. Remember, this technology yeah. keeps on improving itself. Um, so you will be, you will start with refurbishing and mm-hmm. retrofitting. Yeah. Um, and that and that's not only for employment, but also for local manufacturing and localization. It provides its own pipeline, um, mm-hmm. sustainable pipeline. And if you and you if you have two or three of these projects in one country like Mauritania, um, you really have a great opportunity for industrialization, localization um, um, in in country and sustainable doing so. Yeah, Multiple. sustainable sustainable industry. And and I mean I think you mentioned desalination in that that's a huge opportunity as well, particularly in over provisioning the desalination. So you become a platform for you know potential new agricultural industries and you know water is clearly uh, only ever going to increase in value in terms of the prediction on, on water stress, particularly in some of these countries, the impact All of, of, them. of climate so change. So every itself. country we come, every country we come, the first thing is to supplement the the existing depleted water resources. Every country we come, the deficit, there's already a deficit between um, the, the water resource uh, being depleted and being um, f- fed again by nat- natural rain. Yeah. So that's the first, our first protocol is how can we supplement the existing uh, water resource? And then how can we supplement um, use of water in Mauritania? You know, you have camel herders there that's impacted by climate change exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, so how can we, in a sustainable way, uh, mm-hmm. doing this? And then yeah. there's the, 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 the opportunity for agriculture. Just a cautionary note, you know, when we work in deserts, when we talk about agriculture, you can't talk about irrigation, open irrigation. Yeah. You know, it creates it's a, another, another type of disaster. So we're really talking about high value add, value add um, agriculture, opportunity to export mm-hmm. uh, good, valuable products. And, yeah. and we've seen... We've seen so you mean green, greenhouses and or you know drip, yeah drip exactly. feed irrigation so, or, or, which uh, yeah. which lends us to which which actually provides for a very uh, predictable agricultural process and mm-hmm. therefore again export markets so mm-hmm. you can access export markets uh, you know producing green peppers in in a Mauritanian desert mm-hmm. might actually just be feasible and exporting it to yeah because um, you're going to be building you know port infrastructure anyway and and you know shipping so it's, it's complete you know, industrialization i guess yeah fascinating yes. i mean in terms of um the technical side you're obviously an engineer and, and the, this mm-hmm. scale of projects what are some of the engineering challenges there, there's clearly some i mean, I mean it's not all yeah. this is all okay. it's a new new industry yeah so so as, as we said you know the on the on the renewable side on the wind and solar it is it is doing more or less the same thing and the wind mm-hmm. we're obviously tr- trying to get to uh, a larger wind turbine wind generator turbine to make it uh, more efficient um but it it is very very much doing the same thing all over on the on the electrolyzer side we need to scale up um so scaling up the electrolyzers um is 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 
I don't see it as a challenge. It's just going to take a, a, a time to get commercially available um, 50 to 200 megawatt electrolyzers in the market. And then the rest, the rest, ammonia synthesis, um, all of these, these are building blocks that scale, that can scale up. As the, the, the issue here is supply chain challenges, finding a sufficient factories and sufficient manufacturers initially to supply, uh, to supply the world in all the gigawatt projects that, that's happening. We're not the only developer around there. So we foresee supply chain challenges and, and we have already engaged with a lot of OEMs to try and talk and understand this. Uh, we recognize that the OEMs, you know, at, at the same time that, that the green hydrogen industry is blooming and, and exploding, the, the, the power to X industry is still growing. And, and, and so, so there's really um, uh, a lot happening and, and, and it impacts a number of aspects. I'll tell you one thing. We, we just found out about two weeks ago, if you want to order a cable conductor, you need to wait two years, uh, which is something, you know, and, and built out on renewable projects as far. So yeah. um, we see bottlenecks on switch gear and transformers yeah. on cables, yeah. on electrolyzers, but but that will be resolved. That So there will be initial bottleneck mm -hmm. and then it will ease up. I mean, this is this yeah. is how supply and demand. Um, yeah, uh, we, I mean, we saw that in, this, in, in the solar industry a number of times. It was often the, yes. the, the silica processing plants that took four years to build in order to feed the the um you know the um the module plants and uh yeah these 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 bottlenecks are, are going to be natural in, in, in what is a, a fast-growing industry and, um yeah so, the so um the, I mean, within the, the actual other... process of yeah marrying the the, the electrons to the to the molecules and, and the so, so the process. biggest technical i think the biggest technical challenge to resolve would be that um yeah. you, these are big massive standalone grids mm. with only renewable resources on them um uh, and downstream you have loads that would be prefer prefer to run on a base load on a base load profile could run on a little bit less than base load but you have your, your consequences in inefficiency and maintainability um, so one of the bigger challenges to be resolved technically would be how do we, I maintain my own grid stability yeah. um, to the extent that that I um, can actually supply a fairly decent uh, predictable load profile with a, um, a resource. And that's why for us, the hybrid between two resources are, are so critical. Wind, mm -hmm. solar, in some areas, you might have geothermal or hydro. Um, and then the the um, negative correlation, obviously, between those resources is also critical to us. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and the, that the, makes the countries like Mauritania negative, extremely negative, nice. Yeah, the ne sorry to interrupt. The negative correlation um, means windy nights and sunny days, or yeah, yeah, yeah. wind, wind, wind not blowing, uh, or wind blowing when the sun is not shining. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, <laughs> Um, I, I, you look differently at life at the weather, you know, when you develop these projects, when you go somewhere and it's a, and it's a cloudy, uh, wind still day, you, you immediately think what a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah. So, yeah. But, um, but then, but then when it's a, when it's a nice windy night and you, and you wake up and the sun's shining, oh, what a brilliant, what a brilliant yes, resource perfect. profile. Absolutely, We've got to build yeah. the project. <laughs> Our perspective changes. So technically, these are the major challenges that mm. need to resolve. I mean, obviously, it's a long value chain, mm. um, a very long value chain. So optimization uh, along that value chain uh, over a different factors um, is, is, is very interesting and very challenging. Um, any control and instrumentation engineer um, and, um, and feedback engineer would love the amount of transient equations that goes into that uh, model. <laughs> Uh, but but yeah, those are the issues that we resolve. Yeah, and yeah, I guess there'll be software playing a you know a large role, but also potentially obviously batteries or. Uh, but again, you, you you've got to minimize um, minimize the expense and the capex. And but I guess as you phase through and the industry grows, they will learn through doing, and and solutions will. That will become the, the optimization process. I, I, I get. And, um, and the great thing about the development nowadays is that you can match it all with digital twins. Um, so you know that okay. helps a lot. And, yeah. and you know where you can actually build your your whole value chain um, with a digital twin and test it um, mm. with all its qualities. Yeah, I mean it's it's fascinating stuff. I mean, any sort of final final thoughts? Uh, I mean, there's a lot there to do. I mean, you you're obviously very busy um, and and some amazing 
opportunities but i think you've, you've given us a, a real taste of, of the the opportunities and i guess the real impact um that this industry can and will will have ultimately in terms of um specifically going to countries that i guess are backwaters i don't know if that's fair to say um but obviously there are some countries which are you know m major economies that, that also have that that profile but um i mean uh, yeah any thoughts around around final thoughts to share around that yeah, so a number of things come to mind, but the, the first and foremost is it's a partnership. We need to build good partnerships, mm -hmm. whether it's with our host government, whether it's with suppliers, whether it's with private landowners, whether it's with the receptor community in which we operate. We need to build partnership. We're working in the infant industry. A, mm -hmm. a big component of this industry is known, but not in the way we're actually putting it together. We're working on a very long-term partnership, and there's no way we know all the answers now and even pretend to know all the answers now. So if we can build a solid partnership where we then agree how we will resolve this together mm -hmm. for the better good of everybody, that is critical. If we can't do this, it won't work. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is the host, um, the the receptor communities, um, the host also, what are the challenges that it brings? Um, so, we spend quite a lot of time to do that, to, to talk people through the. I think I just, yeah, I, on that last phrase, I just lost you. Um, I think you might need to re, re say that in terms of okay. from host countries, I think, or, or um, uh, just the point around long term partnerships, because yes, yeah, so, so so we we need to build long term partnerships with our host with our hosts, whether it is a host country, host government, um, the receptor community that we're working in. Um, this is this is critical. the The other component in here is that we need to make sure that we have our governments and our receptor communities and our hosts informed in what the, what is the opportunities these projects can bring to them, but also what are the challenges? Mm. Um, because they, it's not you know it's not just all good news. So we know this in in a development side. Um, so we spend quite a lot of time to help people to understand what are the amazing opportunities that it brings, but what needs to happen mm -hmm. in order to to actually reap the benefits from these opportunities, but what could be also part of the impact and how do we minimize and mitigate that? Yeah. Um, so for us, that, that discussion, we start early on in, in, in our processes, our socioeconomic and, uh, discussions is very early on. Yeah. And lastly, and, and I'm doing this because I want to leave a legacy to my children. I've got young children. And um, so the way we, we start off in any country is doing an environmental screening. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've seen in the newspapers and we've seen in the media a, an awful lot of uh, writing going on about, you know, we, we need to change, we need to get to, to net zero, but we also do not want to replace, you know, replace one evil with another with another wrong. Um, so we, we really take the environmental considerations to heart. And because these projects are land-based land and, and, and they have a big footprint, for us it's a critical component of our development, making sure we do do it um, and according to the requirements and, and and not only the requirements of the local government but also I, IFC standards climate change standards um in in the way we implement these yeah excellent there's a lot there it's amazing work uh and yeah I think you, you you're, you're well on the well on the way to leaving a legacy for all your children so Margaret many thanks um for, for taking the time out um of your schedule I know you're flying around the world as, as we speak and um really appreciate uh, taking the time out of your morning to speak to me and and indeed come uh, and speak to to the hygiene industry at the World Hygiene Congress in in, in Rotterdam come October the 9th to 13th so it's been fascinating to talk to you and, and, and just learn some of your insights and perspectives of and of the scale of work that you're doing it's, it's, it's truly staggering when you think back to to you know the the renewables industries as we knew it before so many thanks Stay, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you in person in October. Thank you. You too. Cheers.